sitting on the couch sipping tea. <laughs> <clears throat> Maybe eating a dog biscuit along with it. So I have a pup at home that's got the same kind of devotion you were describing, how uh, Murphy just can't stand to have Francine out of his sight. And he whines if she's not where he can see her, and it drives me nuts. I explained to him I'm home and I'm all right, but uh, it's just not the same, I guess. <clears throat> that kind of devotion to Jesus is something we need. Hang on to him tenaciously. Uh, probably wouldn't even hurt us to whine a little bit if we sense the separation there, would it? God's good. I... Uh, I don't know if I need a disclaimer with today's remarks or an apology to you, maybe. Uh, I'm convinced it's a topic God wants approached and dealt with. I think he gave it to me, but it's an uncomfortable one for me, at least. Uh, it's been kind of an uncomfortable couple weeks, to be honest. In the COVID this time, put me flat on my back for days. Um, <clears throat> I feel like I'm still weak, testing negative, which is encouraging. I encourage you not to get it if you can help it at all. But if you do, and you have some time on your hand, once you get to feeling like reading, I want to encourage you to spend some time in this book looking at signs of the end about conditions that we could expect before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe fill in your head with some promises that help tide you over. Because I And we need to discuss it. I reread some chapters in an old book at home this week. Yeah, I'll see if I can remember the titles to them. And then there's a chapter The Impending Conflict Scripture is Safeguard. going to recognize those titles. It comes from the book, The Great Controversy. It ago, practically. Interesting to me how clearly that was foreseen all those years ago. But even in the natural realm, things are different right now. I looked at the headlines this morning. I noticed that uh, I thought the title was interesting too. <clears throat> A dust storm in Montana. An unexplained, unexpected dust storm near Billings blows across a freeway. And even in Montana, where there's hardly any traffic, or there wasn't when I lived there, six people met their maker this morning, went to their rest, at least. Hundreds of cars involved in an accident from a dust storm. Unexpected dust storm. Floods. Where was that this past week, Virginia? Back in that part of our country with people still missing in the triple digits, I think, people missing in those floods. Drought in other areas of our world. Fires, and think about it, we're just really approaching the big fire season in California now, out west. 
pictures of the lakes in the west that are just dried up. Disturbing to me how often they find a barrel on the bottom of those lakes with human remains in them. It's like it's been a dumping ground for criminal elements for years, and now the lakes are drying up and the bodies show up. <clears throat> Pestilence. I actually am not convinced that uh, that we should include the pestilence in natural phenomena. I'm not so sure, but what that was a man-created bug that's still running rampant in our world. Especially when you have some of the power brokers in our world that just feel like they've got a right and blather on about how the human population needs reduced dramatically reduced in this world, and then you have a bug like this comes around. <clears throat> That's rather personal for me after, you know, a week or two of being sick and then having to fight back from another bout with this virus. Actually kind of suspect that eventually COVID's going to get me. I just, I can't seem to I can't seem to miss it when it rolls around. I, Francine's been counting, and she thinks this is seven times for me that I've had the virus. Uh, I would confess to five of those that where I know I had it. The first, the third, and this time being the most difficult of them. Uh, whatever, I plan to fight it any way I can. But you ever ask yourself kind of questions like, who's profiting from these sort of things? And you start asking questions like that, and you got to wonder about the wars that our world's experiencing, too. The war machinery in this country is making billions of dollars trading in the souls of men in the Ukraine. And it's young men on both sides of the issue that are paying the price. And it's not just the deceased paying the price. Every hapless consumer on this planet is paying a price for enriching those invested in that military industrial complex. The sale of weapons is running into billions and billions and billions of dollars out of this country's economy. <clears throat> They tell us in our country now that inflation last year was at 9.1%. I, I seriously question if they think we're that stupid. 9.1% I don't think touches what's happened to what your dollar will buy in this country. Uh, Francine came home from filling up with gas yesterday. She was kind of pleased. She said the price had dropped to $5.09. <laughs> Give me a break. A year ago, that would have uh, that would have shocked us, wouldn't it? I think of you, David, driving clear to Northway to work. Uh, you're going to have to get a bicycle and start the day before <laughs> because it's getting expensive just to get by in our world. Things are imploding around us. And as the nation implodes, it seems like our political community just engages in round after round of meaningless political theater. Uh, our acting president this week you know, going over to visit in Saudi Arabia and giving a fist bump to the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, supposedly to express his disgust at the murder of Khashoggi, the journalist, crown prince ordered uh, be removed. Uh, that moral giant of a president of ours, uh, at the same time, is encouraging people to protest uh, the Supreme Court decision that makes it a little more difficult to kill the unborn. You know, what's with that? What's, what grounds does 
he think he has for moral outrage at any level. The things he supports. Interesting to me how he celebrates the appointment of people to head up our federal agencies that can't even figure out their own gender. And while the dumpster burns, it's our world, you got a cassock clothed Jesuit waiting in the wings with the solution to our moral issues in his mind's eye. If you don't know what I'm talking about on that, if you're unclear on what I mean, you need to get your Bible out and study that out for yourself. Start maybe in Daniel. Read chapter 11. Spend some time in the book of Revelation. You'll find that toward the end of this world's history, there's powers at play that want control of humanity. Daniel calls him the king of the north and the king of the south. The king of the north is one that's willing to accept your worship. In fact, he craves it. You find that clear back in Babylon's history, Nebuchadnezzar had asked for worship, set up an image and demanded even on pain of death if you didn't give it. The king of the south, on the other hand, uh, first represented by the pharaohs of Egypt, <clears throat> won't even give God the time of day. That's an atheistic power, one that says, who's God that I should obey him? One that even denies his very existence. Those two are in competition for control of this planet. Toward the end of time, just before Jesus comes, the Bible says the king of the north is going to prevail for a while. And it's going to be kind of a hollow victory on his point. There's nothing he can do to stop what's going on in this world. There's no solutions in his hand that amount to anything, but there's no solutions on the other side either. It leaves the world in a difficult position. Thinking minds look out there and they say, this can't go on the way it is. There's those that think the, the final blow might be related to climate change. Does, is there such a thing? Yeah, there probably is is what its causes are. I guess that's kind of open to debate. But you've got to admit things are not the way they were in our natural world. Politically, it seems like people are just powerless to affect anything along the lines of a positive change. There's no human solution to what's going on right now. That puts the world between a rock and a hard place. But it's even worse for the believers, friend. It's even worse for you and I because we know there's no human solution to what's going on. This world is going to implode. Things will get worse until the Lord Jesus sets up his kingdom. Daniel 2 talks about it as being a, a stone that's cut out without hands that smites the image on its feet, grinds it to powder, and that powder is dispersed in the dust. That dust is blown away by the wind, and God's kingdom grows into something durable and lasting, something that really fixes earth's problems. That's the solution as a believer that you look forward to. You know there isn't another solution. The problem's sin, isn't it? This world has defied God and his law, and there's natural consequences that follow disobedience to God's requirements. It brings a natural result. The wages of sin is, what is it? Death. It's death. Thank you. And good to hear a young voice supply that answer. There's no solution outside of that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Interestingly enough, it makes me mad at my church and makes me mad at myself. We're too timid 
to talk about that. We act like, you know, maybe there is some kind of an answer outside of Jesus Christ. We live our lives like tomorrow might get back to normal. Don't expect it. Don't expect the Bible has told you something different. If God's law is disobeyed, consequences follow. And God's law is flaunted by the one side that would rule our world. Call it the political left, the atheistic side of the equation, if you want. You know, they, they won't even give God the time of day. They rub your nose in anything that reeks of, of morality. Their agenda is opposed to anything that appears righteous or normal. The other side, at the same time, the, quotes religious right, if you would like, they haven't got a leg to stand on either because they're trampling on God's law. How can you profess to, to be a Christian to worship the Lord God and rub his law in the dirt, tell people that it doesn't apply, that it's been nailed to the cross? Disobedience has always brought dreadful results, and it still does. We know that. We don't expect things to get better. But we're a little bit shy about talking about it. And it makes me mad at myself. I want things to go on normally like they always have. But I don't expect they're going to. I know, scripturally speaking, they're not going to. The only solution is Jesus Christ. I was thinking about it. You know, we tend to stress verses that talk about our Lord and Savior as being long-suffering, merciful, abundant in mercy, uh, slow to anger. Those are good points. We owe God a debt of gratitude that he is. But slow to anger doesn't mean that God never gets upset about what goes on in this world. Just thinking about some of the things that hit the news this week and how it must make God feel. I know how it makes me feel. You know, you got the abortion issue is front and center right now in our country. Probably needs to be front and center. But when you have a 10-year-old child that's raped and in need of an abortion, something's wrong in this country. You know, that... Those sort of things should not happen in a country that whoever perpetrated that crime should have been made such an example of that it never happened again in this country. But there it is. It's all the time. There's no, no solutions, and it's got to make God angry, the things he sees taking place in this country. Scripture talks about that. I got to looking at some Bible passages, well sitting around my couch waiting to feel like doing something else. And I'm surprised how often God talks about bringing judgment as a result of man's separation from his law, from his clearly expressed will for you and I. I thought I wanted to share just a few of those passages with you today, things I noticed you're going to see right away that I was reading in the Minor Prophets. <clears throat> Open your Bible with me to Zephaniah. We'll probably look at some passages from Amos. Some, ah, see, I made a list of them. Read a few of them. I don't like working off of a list. But I will tell you, friends, that COVID sometimes messes with your brains. And for me, the neurological functions are often the worst when I get a bout of COVID. Um, the ability to sleep goes right down the tube. You wouldn't believe it. <clears throat> I went four days with no sleep this week. I just, your body forgets how to go to sleep. You start to drift off, and then ding, you're wide awake. I ended up telling the Lord, I said, God, I need a blessing from you. I need to hear from you. I need some sleep. So if I don't get some sleep, I know a way to get some. I'm going to get good and loaded, and I'll sleep. And God gave me some sleep. I've had three nights in a row now, but literally, I mean, I was to the point of 
having to deal with it because I don't deal well with not sleeping over a long period of time. But these passages from uh, these Old Testament prophets, I think, are pretty interesting. The book of Zephaniah I never really particularly thought of as being a book that had a whole lot of meaning to us today. But these kind of Old Testament passages, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I think it's like about verse 11, God tells us that these things were written down, they were examples for us, written down for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age are come. That's you and I. We can learn from these Old Testament passages. Zephaniah chapter 1, God says, I'll utterly consume all things from off the land, says the Lord. I'll consume man and beast, consume the fowls of the heaven, fishes of the sea, stumbling blocks with the wicked. I'll cut off man from off the land, says the Lord. I'll stretch out my hand, and he's talking now about his own people. He says, against Judah, I'll cut off the remnant of Baal, them that worship the host of heaven, them that are turned back from the Lord, those that have sought not the Lord nor inquired of him. Goes on. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. I think this is the essence of why God brings judgment on a world, a world that's flaunting his rule. The Lord will be terrible unto them. He'll famish all the gods of the earth, the Bible says. Verse 5 of chapter 3, the just Lord's in the midst thereof. He'll not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgments to light. He faileth not, but the unjust know no shame. I've cut off nations. Their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste that none passes by. Their cities are destroyed so that there's no man, that there's none inhabitants. I said, surely thou wilt fear me, thou wilt receive instruction, so their dwelling should not be cut off, however I punish them. But they rose early and corrupted all their doings. Therefore wait upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, all of my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Do you expect a world as wicked as ours to get back to any semblance of normal? You know, if God doesn't bring judgment on this world and on this nation, the United States of America, in some ways, it might not be a good thing for us. It just means that there's more wrath building up in that cup. In some ways, it would be better if it came sooner than later. Expect it. It's coming. Problems that sin generated, there's a price to be paid for the dance we've been dancing. God will judge this earth I'm going to skip Amos you could you could read any one of these little minor prophets and see things that you'd find relevant to the day and age we live in I think even Joel which the book of Joel has some wonderful promises to the believer things that the spirit of God is going to do in the last days but God tells a story in Joel about an army that he sends that's probably locust in Joel's situation, that bring a judgment on the land because of the sins of God's people. It's going to happen. It comes when God's ways are flouted, when God's law is trampled into the dirt. But let's look at Isaiah. I want to go to Isaiah because there's some promises here that may be helpful to you and I. Time's coming. Uh, hopefully you'll find some comfort in these promises. Isaiah's got parts of the book that read a lot like Revelation. We call those sections the little apocalypse. I'd like to read with you some passages from Isaiah chapter 24 for starts. Verses 1 through 6. Listen to this. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty. He makes it waste, turns it upside down, and scatters abroad the inhabitants thereof it says it shall be with the people as with the priest the servant same as the master the maid same as her mistress 
The buyer, same as the seller. The lender with a borrower, the taker of usury, with the giver of usury. The land shall be utterly emptied, utterly spoiled. For the Lord has spoken this, this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Because they've transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Why is the earth experiencing judgment? Because people have trampled on the law of God. They've transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, because of that, the Bible says, hath the curse devoured the earth. They that dwell therein are desolate. The inhabitants of the earth are burned. There's few men left. You drop down verse 7, two, you just read the whole chapter. It's all the same thing. God's judgments come on the impenitent. It's a natural result of disobedience. The earth's utterly broken down. It's clean dissolved. The earth is moved. But then the promises to God's people. I like chapter 25, verse 9. That one points to the second coming. The day comes when, lo, this is our God. We've waited for him. He'll save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. We'll be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Chapter 26, verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Peace, security for you and I is going to be sourced in Jesus Christ and him alone. If you make provisions for the flesh and you plan for things to get better, you think maybe you got something hedged away that's going to help you with the rampant inflation, guess again, it's going to get worse. If not now, soon. I would not be surprised if this country, this country that profits off of selling tools so the Ukrainians and the Russians can trade in the souls of men. Who says this country isn't going to see that sort of thing? What's to keep bloodshed from coming here? Do you think we deserve it? God will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on him. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us. For thou hast wrought all our works in us. Chapter 26 and verse 9 of Isaiah. When judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let favor be showed the wicked, yet he'll not learn righteousness. Who will learn it then? when judgments are on the earth. Who's instructed by it? It's the believer that's instructed by it. God tells us in this passage, he says, I'm bringing judgment on the earth. The inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness, but it's not the wicked that do. He'll not learn righteousness in the land of uprightness. He'll deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Troubles come our way, the kind of things we studied about in Sabbath school today, the tribulations that, that come into a Christian's life. Don't assume that it's not God that brought you there. God may be trying to teach you a lesson. I love that passage in Daniel. We talked about it a little bit in Sabbath school today. That points to the fact that at the time of the end, there are those amongst the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that are going to fall, but it's to purify them. God's at work in our life. The sword may come. The sword may take some of us for all we know. Do you think it's just unbelievers that die in the Ukraine? That there's no Christian Russian kids dying there? Fighting that war? This life is just a transitory thing. 
the opportunity may come for us to be martyred for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's it matter in the light of eternity? Learn from what God brings on this planet. Be instructed in righteousness when hard times come. And they're coming, friends. Don't despair. Don't look for a solution in this world because it's not there. There's no solution, man-made solution. Those that would propose there is, look at the choices you got. Which side are you going to believe? I mean, there's times where I just feel like, hey, I'd almost have to side with the left. It seems like sometimes they stick up for freedom of conscience and things better than those on the right. But then there's other times you think, with the moral debauchery that that side represents, how in the world could you ever be associated with any of them? But then, are you going to... What's the other direction? It's no better. I mean, this whole world is, it's a dumpster fire. This thing is falling apart around our ears, and there's one solution. The Lord Jesus Christ needs to set up his kingdom first in our hearts, so we're not bashful about talking about him anymore, and then eventually in our world as a whole. He's going to have to wipe the slate clean and start again, or there's no solution. Nathan asked a question in Sabbath school. He asked us, do you ever think about the Lord leading into tribulation? I want to propose, friends, that yes, God does that. Sometimes God takes his people and he marches them right down between the Egyptian army, a steep mountain, and the sea to teach him a lesson to show them that deliverance, that salvation comes from one source and one source only, from God. From God. Yes, God leads into tribulation. Expect it. It's on the way. Uh, I got no idea. what exactly is coming in this world. But I am expecting a few things, and I think solidly based on an understanding of Scripture. I expect a backlash in this country that goes away from the debauchery of the left. I expect a swing way to the right. The king of the north wins for a little while before Jesus comes a pseudo-religious power that wants your worship, that would dictate morality. That's no solution, friends. It's not a place we even want to go. And the thing that's scary to me about it is I even see inroads that that power has made in our own church, our own denomination. What's with the church that won't stand up for people's rights to either take a vaccine or to forego the pleasure? You know, other churches have stood up and said, look, this is a religious issue. We back our people if they don't want to take that shot. Why didn't we? You know, what's... When did liberty of conscience get to be something that wasn't precious to the Seventh-day Adventist church? Now, for me, I took the thing. You guys all know I did. I took the vaccine. I thought it's, you know, I work in people's homes. Maybe it's something I can do to protect those around me. It doesn't work. It didn't protect anybody. It didn't protect me. But why? Why would we side with anything that doesn't stand up for your right to decide? Forced allegiance to the king of the north? That's out of the question for me. To side with the opposition, the king of the south, that won't even give God the time of day, that denies his existence, that's not an option. The only option left to the commandment keeping people of God is to get in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Tight relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where security is because there is no other fix. This thing's done. 
This is a train wreck. Trouble's coming. Prepare for it by getting right with Jesus Christ. Okay. Probably be in trouble for having expressed that, but I think the Lord really laid it on my heart. And every time I opened the word this week, I saw instances of God saying, judgment follows disobedience. What else would we expect? It's always been that way. You choose to ignore God, trample on his requirements in your life, things go badly. Things go badly in a society when that happens. We've done it. We've sown the wind. We're fixing to reap the whirlwind. Prepare for it by getting right with Jesus yourself. And don't be timid about it. Talk to people about it. Point them to a solution that really works. Thank you, Jesus. Let's close. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you didn't leave your people in the dark as to the things that take place before Jesus comes back. I think about how he told us that there'll be a time of trouble such as just never was and that if it wasn't shortened, there wouldn't be any flesh survive at all. We don't expect things to get better, not really, not deep down in our hearts. But we do know that there's safety in Jesus even, even if we should perish in something that happens here. What's it matter in the light of eternity? Grant us a peace that comes from knowing Jesus and trust in him, in his name. Amen.